Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. Yes, as the title says, Ultimate Guide to Call of Dragons. So if you're a new player or looking to play Call of Dragons for the first time, this guide will give you everything you're going to need to know to kickstart off your journey in the world of Tamaris. Hello everyone, so yes, we're going to be going over the general overview first of Call of Dragons, what the game is, what you need to do, and then we're going to break it down into segments, all timestamped for you guys, so you can check it out, re-watch it if you need to, and learn the game. So, what is Call of Dragons? You're probably wondering, right? Because if you're looking at it from an outside point of view, it does look a bit crazy if you're never playing these type of games before. And the way this game is categorised is a 4x city builder strategy game. Meaning, you have to prioritise basically your time and management skills in building up power and getting stronger, right? The Call of Dragons universe has a little bit of a twist compared to the older boys where they've added in stuff like these PvE raid events so you can go into Call of Dragons and you're basically fighting for the glory of killing these different types of behemoths and in the game when you do kill them in the harder difficulty which we will talk about a little bit later you can get special rewards like the avatar frames so you can flex all of these off if you have killed them in certain requirements right so that's the general basis of call of dragons the whole premise is as you can imagine you're going to try and make an account grow in power become strong join like an alliance and you're fighting in your server so in your server as you can imagine when we zoom out there's loads of different alliances here and you're going to be fighting potentially against some of these guys but what ends up happening in Call of Dragons is at the end of your very first season, which lasts between 90 days to about 95 days after the season summary period has, has finished, you will then migrate slash fight into a new division of places. So if you look at mine, for example, I'm in season one plus of Stars Reignited and we're fighting in server two, but we're fighting against server six, seven, eight, and nine for the glory of everything we've just discussed, right? So that is the basic premise, you know? Imagine every time you're playing this game, you are building up your account. Every season it starts, you're gonna try and power up even further and obviously fight for the glory of that game. So that's the basics, right? We're gonna get that out of the way. If you've never played Call of Dragons, that should hopefully give you some insight on what you want to be doing. So how does it work, right? So let's switch up and go into the basics of Call of Dragons. So when you first ever start the game, even if you're never played the game before, the first choices you're gonna have, have is the opening factions. There's three factions currently in the game, which is the Spring Wardens, the League of Order, and the Wilderberg. Each of these different factions offer different special units. And you can check these units out by just clicking the portraits and seeing what they do. Each, like I said, unit is a little bit different. So you can check out the flying units, for example, for the human race. This is flying magic marches. So if you want an extra mage march, it's really good to have it. Spring Wardens, you can see they have a flying cavalry march. So every different faction has a special unit. It has a different special ability attached to it, which is really cool. But the base stats compared to every other game like Rise of Kingdoms, the base stats are all the same. So you don't have to worry about any of the base stats changing. Everyone shares the exact same base stats unless it's a you know, specified reason why. So when you pick your first ever faction, the one you should pick, honestly, is either going to be Spring Wardens or League of Order for most new players. And this is because with these two factions, you get access to Wild Deer, which is a phenomenal, amazing, honestly, one of the best epic heroes in the entire game. And you get access to him from the very start. Spring Wardens gets the opposite. So instead of a Mage March, if you're thinking of playing an Archer, well, guess what? You get the best version of an Archer March in the game, which is really, really powerful to have as a starting companion because the way this game works, as you've picked your starting faction, you will then do the tutorial, right? Once you complete the tutorial, it should have taught you the basic premise 
of main quest lines. So if we check the top left corner here, this is the main quest line, right? So for me right now, I need to upgrade my school of sages to 25 and I would get 5,000 gems and nearly a half a million worth of resource in each of them for the reward, right? So by completing the main quest line, your main faction you've picked that starting here, you're gonna gain a bunch of heads or sculptures to upgrade that hero. And that moves swiftly into, as you can imagine, the hero category, right? So the heroes in this game, as you can say, if we're talking about the archers, you're gonna start out with Guan Win. And for completing the main quests and just claiming the main quest line, as well as other means like scouting, for example, you're gonna gain access to sculptures to upgrade your hero. The basic premise, and this is one rule everyone should honestly abide by now, is always, always max out this first skill first, and then you always max out the next three skills, depending on the order, right? The reason why you always max this first skill out is because it is the most beneficial skill that the Legion has. It's almost like your ultimate skill if you were playing like League of Legends, right? Or a different game where you have special powers, right? When you hit the critical mass of a 1000 rage, which we will go over, don't worry, you'll then cast your ultimate ability. And for Gwen, you do a bunch of single target damage, right? This is again, the same for every other hero. We could go to Kanara, which is another marksman hero, or we could go to even Emery's, which is another cavalry hero now. And you're gonna see everyone has the same premise where this powerful skill is on a cooldown. From here, you'll notice the next three skills are generally skills that are passive base. What passive means is you constantly have this skill active if you have the skill unlocked, right? So right now, my hero Emery is being 52111. He will have that max damage on his first skill, which is very important as you can now understand. And then the second skill is the Rage Accumulation. We have loads of stats here, which is Cavalry Attack Bonus and March Speed, and even Extra Damage Dealt and Hero Skill Damage Bonuses, right? And all of these passives are always applied when you're in combat, as long as you meet the requirements that that passive skill reaches, right? So you're probably wondering, how should you level up a hero? So what you should normally do if we had someone like for example, Syndra on here to level up, you can see I need to level up this first skill. So what you can still do in Call of Dragons is over level a hero. So you can notice here we are level 9 and now we're level 10 and you would imagine you can't go any further like some games. But in Call of Dragons, it is different. You can still, as you can see now, keep leveling up your hero. And we're gonna go even all the way up to level 20 for the hero. And you can see now we have the ability to use those levels in our talent trees. Talent tree is just a way to enhance the power individually of your commander. And if you're wondering about hero guides, I have all the hero guides on my channel. Just check the channel out. And if you're looking for a specific hero, we have them all covered, right? So by doing this, you can see we're gaining hero power, right? Every single time we are placing this, even if we keep upgrading 500, 500, and every single time it will give you 500 power so it's a really good way of gaining power but you'll notice we're still one stars and we still got our one skill unlocked is which is the best thing to do because once we've finally maxed this skill out to five out of five what you can then do is upgrade your star level the way the star level system works in this game is by every 10 levels, there is a upgrade of some sort. So the first level 10, when you go to two stars, will unlock that second skill. And this is where the skill pro problem will start to occur for a lot of new players. Because if we look into the skill allocation now, of a hero, you'll then see upgrading your skills increases the level of a random, and this is even bolded out now, so you can tell this is random, unlocked skill by one, and each skill has a max level of five, right? So basically what this is saying is if you have skill one and skill two unlocked, 
and you try to upgrade the skill, you have a 50-50 chance in order of hitting the correct skill. Because currently in Call of Dragons, as of this guide, there is no skill lock system in the game apart from the way they've gone around it with the star system, right? So once you've actually upgraded the stars, as you can see, you're going to get access to the skills. And once you've maxed out an entire hero's skills now, you will then get the awakening stage. This will always be ready to unlock as long as you are at level 40 for the hero, allowing you to get the unlock ability. You can again go into skills and this will be prompt up. For example, if we look at Alowin and we go to skills, it is currently locked, but as long as we reach level 40 and all of our skills are maxed, we will then unlock this for free. We don't have to worry about it, right? So if you're wondering about hero requirements, we do have a picture for you guys here just to sum up this segment on heroes. And this is all the hero skill requirements, right? So if you're looking to invest into specific heroes, it's gonna cost you a total of 690 sculptures for any of the legendary heroes. It's gonna cost you 440 for any of the epics and then 340 total for any of the elites. As you can see, the way we've got the table written out is for the first one, it's gonna cost you 10, for the second 10, third 10, fourth 15, right? So you can see it's quite simple, right? How the, the, the whole system is laid out. If you want this and you wanna actually see this table and save it, you can join the Call of Dragons um, Discord that we have here. And that will allow you to obviously check out all of my infographics and guides for Call of Dragons. So that should help you guys out, right? So that is all the basic premises on your heroes that you're gonna need to know, right? All the basics covered that should get you going in Call of Dragons, right? You can then now look at artifacts. Artifacts is the next game mechanic that is introduced to you through the tutorial phase. And this is when you can equip a artifact to your march and it basically adds a some sort of special ability to that march. And it works the exact same as your hero's skill one. So certain artifacts here have rage requirements. So if we look at someone like Lilia, for example, Lilia, obviously skill one, 1000 rage cost to trigger, right? But if we look at the Phoenix Eye artifact here for the mages, we will now look, it has a 1600 rage requirement and even a cooldown of one minute 30. What does this mean? This means in combat, you're gonna have to generate rage through either taking damage or dealing damage and you can gain the rage requirement for that artifact. Once it's filled up, you will then be able to use it, right? So if we just quickly summon some marches out, we're gonna showcase this all out for you guys right now. So you can see we've got some artifacts. All of them need rage apart from one. And we're gonna showcase that in a moment, right? So we're gonna activate this artifact. But when we look at the combat now, if you watch all of these bars, you can see they're starting to go up. So the spring blades is almost ready. So we're gonna trigger by using the hotkey now. And we can use, as you can see, an aiming style, wherever you want, short, close, long range, and then activate. The artifact, really cool ability as you can see, and then it will then come back once it's complete. Same with all the other ones, you can see now they are going off cooldown or they're going off the rage because you've exited combat. So make sure you're staying in combat if you are wanting to use one of your artifacts, right? So when we go into artifacts, artifacts honestly behave the exact same as heroes. So as long as you understand that whole hero section right now, artifacts are gonna feel like a baby walk, right? So artifacts are the exact same as a hero. You're gonna be able to invest into your different artifacts and upgrade them like your hero. They're gonna have their own star rating and these are gonna stay between seasons. All of your damage you can see is applied here as well as the stats, right? You can upgrade any of these artifacts by gaining Arcane Dust and just pressing the green button here will allow you to just simply add the XP needed to level up. Again, simply once these 
different artifacts have reached their different requirements, so level 40, level 50, and 30, you will still be able to upgrade these star ratings. If you are looking for an artifact guide, don't worry, we have one on the channel. I'm gonna try and make sure throughout this video, there's some links above for you guys so you can click on and check out individual guides specifically to get a better understanding, right? So, with all that said, we've got all the most of the things to do with artifacts apart from one major thing that a lot of players get mixed up with. And in artifacts, we have two types in Call of Dragons. We have PvP and PvE. PvE means player versus environment, meaning any sort of patrols, creatures, behemoths in dragon trials and certain events as well, where you are fighting basically the AI of the game. PvP is player versus player, so this is going to be available in combat. So you're going to use these in combat as well as PvE content too. So they have a multi-flex use on them. And the way you can tell the difference between these two artifacts in the game is pretty simple. If we go on to one, for example, like Viola's ball we have on showcase here, a PvP artifact firstly always generally has a rage cost apart from some niche scenarios but they normally have a rage requirement and within their actual blurb you can see where they describe how the ability works and if it just states it like you can see here you know this is going to be pvp based the difference is if we look at someone like bombflinger bombflinger states this deals damage to the selected legion, but then in brackets, darklings, dark creatures, and behemoths. So this very explicitly tells you this only works on PvE content, and this matters for you guys, because if you try to use this in PvP, the player you use it on will take zero damage, they'll take zero stun effects, they won't take anything. So don't use these in PvP, right? So that is nicely now going from the factions from the heroes into the artifacts and now i'm gonna break down the whole beginning experience on what you guys need to be focusing on to power up so when we're going into now the premise of the game we've gone over obviously the heroes artifacts and the faction stuff but let's go into now buildings right because in this game you can imagine you're gonna gain power from upgrading your heroes and artifacts, but you could also gain power from upgrading your buildings, research, and training troops, right? So, if we go to my profile breakdown, you can click on more info, and it does showcase this in a nice different breakdown, right? So your building power for me currently is 10.4 million, tech power 9.8, legion power 7.5, and hero power 2.8, right? So you can see you've got a really nice spread of power there. And the re way you can do this is by following your main quest line, right? So your main quest line might require you to upgrade a certain building to progress it. But the way you want to do it in Call of Dragons is a little bit different compared to something like Clash of Clans, right? In this game, for a normal player, what you want to do is upgrade the bare minimum that is required for your buildings, right? So if we would look at the Sacred Hall, and our Sacred Hall would require, for example, a new research building upgrade. So we need our City Hall needs the research center upgrading to say level 21, for example. And then our other building was the military building for our infantry units. All we would do is make sure we upgrade only those buildings for that building requirement to upgrade it for you. I'm gonna switch over to a new account just to showcase this for you guys in a really quick blitz example so you can understand this for yourself. So we're on our baby account right now on server 152 if we check it out. 
And I'm going to showcase the building philosophy and the research philosophy on what you guys should be doing to upgrade your buildings correctly. So a lot of people make the mistake of trying to upgrade every single building before going up. This is the major mistake that you do. You can do this for certain buildings, but not all of them, right? Some buildings you can always upgrade if you really wanted to is your different barracks and you know training troop ones because these are always going to give you more return because you're obviously training more troops per hour when you're doing this, right? So really, really good to do. But when it comes to buildings, you always want to focus on two things. Your main quest line will have obviously what it requires you to do, but then your sacred hall will have its own areas right so we need our requirements which is the resources that we know but these free buildings are needed so this is what we're going to do we're going to build these different you know buildings and you only want to build guys the building the city hall requires so if we need a fungal tree level six we're going to go to the fungal tree and we're going to start upgrading this and hitting the help button if you've joined alliance which obviously we haven't covered yet which we will do in a second don't worry but once you've completed that building, obviously you're going to be able to upgrade it again. Make sure what you're watching here, you don't do. I'm about to use gems and speed ups to speed through this just for a, an example for the you new players right now, right? So we need our fungal tree all the way to level six and our walls. So we're going to hit the fungal tree and we're going to just spam the gem button just so we can get it to the correct area. And then we hit what I call the Holy Trinity of buildings. So as you notice, the sacred hall requires our wall going to level six. So in order to upgrade the wall, you always need to upgrade the hospital. But in order to upgrade the hospital, you always need to upgrade the foundry. And this is free buildings you always, always have to upgrade. So you're going to notice now, I'm going to quickly speed these up so you can see that we have the ability to do them. And now, when we go and finish off the last fungal tree, we just need to upgrade the mint. Upgrade. And you can use, obviously, your resources for this, but I'm going to be using, obviously, speed ups just to speed this up for you guys so the video doesn't go too long. So it is going to be a long one already, as you can tell. But now the sacred hall is ready to upgrade, right? So now we can click upgrade, go, press the buttons, what we need, get the resources, and hit upgrade. So now our sacred hall is ready. So once this is done in 4 hours and 42 minutes without any helps, we will be able to carry on upgrading our buildings. And that is how you want to progress your buildings, guys. You want to always focus on the main objective for your sacred hall and keep going, right? So here's a couple of building tips, though, just to finish out this section. So when you go to your sacred hall and you finish the building upgrade for that city hall, you should always upgrade your alliance center. The reason why I'm saying this is because your alliance center gives you extra help chances every single time you upgrade it. And the more helps that you have in your arsenal, it will reduce the time of these buildings, meaning you don't have to waste your gems or speed ups on them and just let the time passively do its thing, right? So it's a very important aspect of the game. When we look at research, research works the exact same way. So if we look at our eco tech here, we only have one of our research queues available. I'll showcase this a little bit later on how to get the second, but you will do the minimal requirements. So you can see I'm on one out of one, then I did one out of five here, and then I pushed one out of five. And you see now I can't upgrade any further until level 10. So what I am now doing is upgrading architecture because this increases the city build speed, meaning we reduce our city costs on our speed ups, which is phenomenal, right? The less speed ups we're using, the better. And it's how honestly the Ecotech tree works and how tech in general is gonna be done. So if we look at our main tree here, we're gonna speed this up again by using our gems, as you can imagine. Once you've hit all one out of ones, you'll notice you're gonna be able to click on this and the intelligence gatherance is gonna 
allow you to progress unlock your tier two units so you're just going to keep doing that minimal minimal research requirement by just hitting the research button or even in the early game which is a little secret tip here mid video if you are doing some scouting scouting does give you the ability here to get some of those nice different types of research so just make sure you're doing that you can get a bunch of the early game research done for free nice little tip there during this guide so that is all you're going to need to know so far on the buildings research and troop training side i hope it makes sense to you guys why you need to do these three different areas the way we do and it will allow you as you can imagine to grow power on screen i'm going to showcase some city hall requirements which is really cool these requirements here are showcased and when you unlock your city hall at these levels you will be available to actually unlock um, a new area so at city hall 5 you get in your alliance city hall 7 you get the monument city hall 16 is when you unlock your tier 3 unit and then at City Hall 21 is Tier 4. You can imagine at City Hall 25, and that's why I haven't put it here, is when you unlock T uh, Tier 5 for your last unit. So when we look at the right here, we also have different marches. At the start of the game, you will only get access to two, but to get three marches, you need to get a City Hall level of 11. City Hall level 17 unlocks the fourth march, and City Hall 22 unlocks that final march for you guys. So that is all of those little bits that you're gonna need that right there. And what I'm gonna bring up in a moment for you guys is another infograph what i have made and this is just basically all the requirements for each of the city halls right so if you're looking for you know what does each individual city need right what does each of these bad boys require don't worry i've got you guys covered and we're gonna showcase it in a second when the application wants to work i do apologize So if we look at this and we enlarge it, this is now, if we look, all the city hall requirements and things you need per stage, right? So if you're looking for individual stuff, again, all this information, guys, is on my Discord. So you don't have to try and screenshot this. I've got this and you can check in the description below for that Discord link. But here is everything you're going to need to know for each, each of each individual city hall upgrade, the cost, the time, and the power that is going forward, right? So I hope that little infograph there helps you guys to final this stage out. So now what we're going to do is finish up on what you do in Call of Dragons, right? So I've gone over, you know, the general overview of the game. I've given you guys the basics of factions, heroes, and artifacts, and what, how you should be upgrading those heroes. And now we've covered over the buildings research side. So let's go into the actual gameplay on what a daily routine and what you guys need to be doing on a daily basis to take advantage of call of dragons welcome back if you've enjoyed the video so far guys and you thought it was so informative smash that like comment and subscribe like always i am an official call of dragons content creator trying to give you guys all that educational needs in a video for you so you can hopefully enjoy this game as much as i do right because i absolutely adore it so we're going to go into the season and how generally it works so in the game the whole premise is a seasonal gameplay um, rotation. So what this means is when you jump into your very first account, you're going to be located in the Burning Stars campaign. So any of these kingdoms right now on screen, as you can see, are in the Burning Stars and Dragon Calls location. 
This is the very start of the game. This is where it teaches you and helps you a lot out in the early game. It gives you all the behemoths in the start up as well. They're a lot easier to kill. You have a lot more easier on the controls. Like just everything generally is easier in this mode, right? But this is your first season. And when you're in this season, all of your progress is going to be saved for your main city. So anything in your main city you've done is going to be saved. Any of your hero investments you've done is going to be saved. Any of your artifact investments also are going to be saved. And when I mean investments, I'm talking about any levels or any stars. In a season, what happens is you play 90 days in Call of Dragons competing against all the other alliances like we said in the early stages of the video. And you'll be fighting against PvP players and behemoths. At the end of that season, what happens is it resets and your hero level just your hero level will go back down to one. Also, any XP books you had will also disappear and we'll explain the reason why in a moment. So you can see all of this information in your August stone and this is why we've left it from the building area to now because the August stone gives you your season life cycle so you can see at the start everyone will be on unyielding fate and as the season progresses you're going to get across these different objectives and if you complete one of these objectives and you're a part of an alliance that is in that objective guess what you're going to get some rewards and the cool thing is about this whole tree is as you can see i personally am in a different campaign to you guys but you can still get these rewards. Every season so far, this track will reset and give you rewards every single season. So it's very good for a free to play player to be in an active alliance and participate in. But when we go into the season overview now, you can see obviously your season feature and the season rewards. In the season overview, this is gonna give you a little story about the area, but this is the general gist of the game. You're going to be fighting for behemoths, as you can imagine, for those extra rewards and then capturing passes to fight your opponents. Once you've done this and you've conquered, hopefully to the end, you're going to be in stage three where the flame dragon is. Once you've done the flame dragon, guess what? This is where season reset occurs. Season reset occurs again around the 90th day to the 95th day. It depends on your season reset timer on that. But once that occurs, these are the only things that are going to disappear. And I'm going to explain why. So your hero levels, CP items, and tactical manuals all go away. You're going to go back to level 1 and 0 on any of these items. And the reason why is, if you're a free-to-play player, imagine now someone like myself, even as a low spender, I have tons of CP saved up, right? And if I go into the new s season, guess what? I would have all that CP saved up and I have an advantage over you. But now this is not the same. This all gets wiped and we go again at the start from scratch at the same pace. So if you're a very active player in this game, you're gonna take advantage of this because you will be playing compared to the non-playable, you know, or non-active players. This is the exact same thing to do with Artifacts and Arcane Dust. Later on, we are going to discuss it soon, but Policies, Prestige, Merits and Elixir are all going to be similar items that all disappear at the end of the season, so don't worry. Finally, your Dragon Trial will reset, and this is what we're going to go into next, which will cover Policies and Prestige. So all of these different areas will reset to one allowing you to get again more rewards and be on a level playing field at the start of each season so once you've done your season reset you'll be in a new division so instead of being in just server 200 you might be for example in a division where if we look you will go against four to five different, you know, servers. So you could be server 200 versus 201, 2, 3, 4, and 5, for example, right? And then you'll be again doing the exact same thing you've just done last season in season 1, but against everyone now in season 1+. plus. So take all that knowledge, everything you've learned from season 1, and put it against your opponents. And that is, honestly, the whole game plan 
of Call of Dragons. That's what you're gonna be doing every time you're playing this game. And honestly, it's a blast to do, right? The only thing some people do disenjoy is some of the grinding aspect, which I'm about to showcase now, which is Dragon Trials. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about in the game is the campaign. And the campaign is very important for this game compared to other games because in Dragon Trials, you're gonna gain passive hero XP, passive currency that you're gonna be able to spend in the store specifically for Dragon Trials, and you're gonna gain prestige. And prestige is, as well as hero XP, two mechanics you're gonna be needing to finish out on your season, right? So your campaign here, the way this works, as you can imagine, just complete it as fast as you can. If you get stuck on a certain level, that just means you're not strong enough right now. So just give it a couple of days, power up, get you guys a little bit stronger, come back to it, right? And you'll notice it, you will complete it. So you're just gonna try and complete these and the more you complete, the more stars you get, Again, the more passive rewards you claim, you can hit the loot, you can see here's some I've already got in three hours, 32K worth of prestige, but already 11,000 worth of XP, so we can hit the claim button right there, claim that, and go back, right? So the reason why this is important is because of that prestige, and this is the last mechanic I'm gonna introduce to you guys in the Ultimate Guide video here before we round things up with a summary and the final tips and tricks I'm gonna give you guys to Call of Dragons. So your prestige is used on the notice board. It sounds crazy, but when you get the notice board and you've completed a couple of your dragon trials, you will gain access to policies. Policies is this button located here, and when you press it, it is another sort of almost tech tree. But instead of just being a tech bonus, which is a pay to win format where you can imagine I don't know, Crystal Tech, if you wanna be a Rise of Kingdoms player. This tech tree is so PVE friendly. It, there's, there's the only PVP element that everyone, and I mean everyone, free to play spender will always get is the max Legion capacity on each of these trees to help you obviously get through content. But everything else, if you look at it, is different things that you as a player will pick to help yourself basically level up in the season. So if you need a bit of extra peacekeeping damage, guess what, you can do that. If you need a little bit more hero XP, again, you can do that. If you're leveling up artifacts the next day, why not just level up artifact expertise and get the chance of getting double arcane dust, right? So you can see why the policy system's there. It's there just to aid you, almost just like a little side tool, a little side project that, again, it will reset at the end of the season. So you don't have to worry if you make any mistakes. You shouldn't pay any gems into this again, because again, it resets. So if you pay gems into this, you're wasting those gems and they're gonna be disappeared. So you're not gonna get any of that return back. So that is everything. Oh, honestly, I think that you're gonna need to get away with, with Call of Dragons. As long as you guys join a alliance in your server, participate, ask questions, follow the markers, with that, you're gonna do very well in Call of Dragons. Honestly, you're gonna be able to play the open field, you're gonna be jumping into some behemoth raids like this flame dragon right here and trying to conquer it. You're gonna be in large scale PVP fights that might occur on your server. And during that, you're gonna be learning as you go through, right? So just remember when you're playing this game, it is not a sprint, it's a marathon. You're not gonna be expected to be end game straight away. This is a long game where, to be honest, a lot of players play this for at least one year or more to see some super strong benefits on their account. But that first year when they're playing it is all about learning, grinding, and honestly, loving the game. And you will fall in love with it if you follow this guide so far. So I'm gonna finish up this guide with the final tip, which is VIP and spending, right? I'm not gonna go over spending in itself because I'm gonna make a spending guide in total, but VIP is important, why? Because when you get VIP in this game, VIP is the way to access the final thing that you guys were probably wondering when I'm gonna discuss it, but it is your research queue. 
So the main goal, I would say, for a lot of free-to-play players is two things. In the early game, you're going to be on zero level buffs, right? So you're going to have this. In the early game, you're going to use all of your gems as much as you can in VIP. You're going to hit the plus icon and you're just going to spend your gems in this. Why? Every single time you upgrade your VIP level, you can see you're gaining buffs. And these buffs are permanent buffs that you have on your account. And the big milestone for you guys at first might be level four, just so you can help yourself, you know, get a free hero that you might have unlocked through the tavern or the artifact system. Or you're going to be going through all the way to at least seven, because seven is a really good push to stay on for a little while. Why? You're going to get two epic hero tokens. Two epic hero tokens is going to allow you to finish off a couple of heroes really, really uh, quickly early on. And it also gives you that 10% march speed. But the final main objective for everyone, no matter what, free to play, low spender, whale, is always to achieve VIP level 8. As soon as you achieve VIP level 8, you're going to gain a 10% research speed reduction. You're also going to gain that second research queue, which is the most important thing about this. So you can now research things two at a time. And then on top of this, your daily gift turns into a legendary one. That is correct. So you can choose any of the legendary heroes that you have unlocked in this daily gift section here, and you will be able to use them and unlock them, right? This is the same all the way through until you get to the final area, level 14, where you get two, and at level 15, you get two. So that's where you can spend your gems at the moment. And then once you hit that VIP level, you should save your gems like I have been doing. And you can use them in certain events like the lucky spin. This is an event that I'm personally not going to spin on. Why? It is just a universal wheel. But in the game, you'll see different wheels where you can unlock certain commanders like Madeline, Kanara, and Frega. And by doing this, you can unlock them by just spinning with gems or as you can see, with some tickets. So it's just as simple as that as you can see to do it, right? And by doing that, you're gonna unlock some new heroes and use your gems. We can hit this, as you can see, purchase with gems, replace the five I've just spent, easy as pie, right? So that is the way you can obviously use your gems after you've got VIP. If you're looking to spend, this is the tip I'm gonna give you guys here. The blaze of glory is always the best at the moment pop-up bundle in this category that is not a pop-up bundle for unlocking a new hero as you can imagine unlocking a new hero does have its personal ability um, pop-up where you can unlock 10 sculptures for that hero for paying $4.99 right but in here you can get other stuff you can get monthly packs monthly packs are really good value but you can also get the daily deals these daily deals here when you are able to you will start off with Valen, i think kanara and nico or you'll start with a certain roster of heroes but over time as your server gets older you unlock more and more heroes and if you're a little bit of a spender and you miss the hero like i did like Sindrion, guess what you can pay the little fee of $2.99 or $2.49 on the PC client and buy a chest that will allow you to unlock that hero later down the line if you don't own him, right? So that is everything, guys. That is going to be my ultimate guide to Call of Dragons. I know it was a long video and it's time sound all the way through, but thank you for watching all the way through. I hope this has honestly helped players coming and looking at the game for the first time understand what to do how to play it and get a good at least mindset in the game right because once you get that good mindset going you're gonna fall in love with it you're gonna find an alliance you're gonna find some new friends honestly and just you know they're not not never not gonna stop playing let's say that it's just so fun and addictive right so i hope you've enjoyed the video smash like comment and subscribe and with all that said guys stay safe stay sneaky and peace out everyone